gave her you the what Julie's talking about this ultimatum. This is a text conversation between Kent Hovind and Alexander Alfano, a supposed attorney helping Kent in his federal case. He was supposedly intermediating between Kent and I, March 26th of 2021. I had just moved out and I'm saying to Alexander and Kent, please do proceed with professional mediator soon. Thank you, Cindy. And Alexander promises that he's going to get us a mediator to repair the marriage. Alexander had trouble with his wife and got reconciled and was very grateful for that and was trying to do the same thing for Kent and I. Little did he know Kent was using him. Kent had no intention of reconciliation because I knew too much. Please remember, and this is something Julie didn't bring out, the whole thing started when I discovered Kent's cover-up. The cover-up of drugs with Steve Lynn, giving them to new converts. There were seven people as witnesses who said to Kent, yes, Steve gave marijuana to Kenny and Timmy. Um, Julie was there, Mark Stoney was there, Kenny and Timmy were there, Freddie was there, Eddie was there. Eddie is Jody's husband. Uh, Jody's interview I just re-uploaded without Steve in it, according to his request, Steve Bolin. When Steve Bolin turned on me, he asked me to pull down his stuff off of my channel. So I removed his voice from Jody's interview. Jody leaves a very, very good interview, and she talks about that night. That's the night Kent Hovind turned on me and started the bipolar lie in order to discredit my witness. He told everybody at that meeting that we were not allowed to talk about it anymore. We couldn't say anything bad about Steve. And this is clearly against Kent Hovind's policy. He had a policy at that time that you couldn't even drink in a bar um, off campus if because you represented the ministry. Okay, here's the beginning of the ultimatum, May 21st. One of several, I'm sure, 2021. From Kent Hovind. Sundown, it's off. In case you're not sure, he's referring to his ring. You see that mark where the wedding ring used to be? He starts out with a threat. If you don't do these things, I'm going to divorce you. See here, I'm taking my ring off already. Just to scare you, just to hurt you. Just to show you mean nothing to me. You're nothing but trash to me. Sundown, it's off. Now, let's start from scratch. Miss Lincoln, I'd be interested in dating you with the prospect of marriage in mind but the following items will need to be agreed to before we proceed. Really? Um, we are already married, sir, and these agreements were already made three years ago when we got married, to the contrary. So you think you can just erase all of our agreements and start over with your greedy bait and switch number one several have expressed legitimate concerns that you have something like a bipolar disorder true or not i'd like you to have a medical and psychological exam by professionals to determine whether or not you do i will pay for the exams by the way i had one and he did not pay for it he refused to pay for it. And it said, I have nothing at all like bipolar. Rather, I had PTSD from being gaslit from this evil man. Not to mention abused by name calling from Steve Lynn, calling me a Jezebel, Brady Byram telling me to shut my pie hole, uh, Ernie Land calling me a bipolar idiot, all kinds of other stuff. Steve also calling me a snake, a fucking bitch. Kent himself 
had called me a greedy bitch when I had given over to the ministry and I had donated five years of free labor. That's cruel. That's abuse. Number two, I would like you to admit that I did not body slam you when you were attacking me to break my phone. Like Julie said, the judge claimed him guilty. He did body slam me. And I was not attacking him to break his phone. I reached to grab his phone. And when I couldn't get it, I slinked away because I knew I couldn't pick a fight with a man six foot one, I'm five foot seven. A man I already knew was trying to get me thrown in jail. I did nothing but reach for the phone and then slink away when I missed. He's lying. If you will do this in writing and never bring it up again, I will pay half the medical bill or $1,100. That's another reason why I went ahead and made the report for the body slam. All the medical insurance claims had fallen through. Nobody was going to pay this bill. And Kent was not only lying in public about it, he was stiffing me with a $2,000 bill. And so, yeah. Number three. I'd like you to admit in writing that I advised you not to evict Steve from Shiloh and you ignored my advice and started a most unfortunate and expensive chain of events. Yes, from the time Steve called me a Jezebel in March of 2020 after the drug bust, I was asking Kent, please, will you get him out of my house? Why are you allowing him to call me a Jezebel? And actually Kent was joining him at that time. He said he was gonna kick me out of the house if I discussed it any farther. And that any of the seven witnesses that discussed it any farther would also be kicked off campus. I was no different than a worker, even though I was his wife. When you're covering up a truth like that and you're persecuting someone just for telling the truth, that's a sign of a criminal organization and a cult. That's how cults operate. So yes, he did advise me not to evict Steve. And I obeyed my husband from March until December. And Steve continued with his shenanigans, not paying rent in June and making up stories about how Nick had damaged the house a year earlier. And then he refused to pay rent again in November. Not to mention Kent and Steve had taken my key from the office and accused me of snooping in the office when I was doing nothing but working in the office. Steve and Kent had gone into my mother's cabin, told my mother that I was in rebellion against my husband and I had been caught snooping in the office. I said, uh, the office is videotaped. If you will kindly observe the video, you'll see I was working. Oh no, they're not interested in the videotape that shows the truth. They're interested in driving Cindy away. She knows too much. She's too um, set upon the truth. We can't get her to abide by this gag order. I just found out that in Kent's 2006 court case, uh, I found the um, transcripts. They're on the internet under courtlistener.com. It says that the evidence presented in that 2006 case showed that Kent required all of his employees to sign do not discuss statements, non-disclosure agreements, non-disclosure agreements in order to work there. 
He wants absolute control over and above truth, over and above your conscientious objection. So yes, by the time all this was happening, I was done. I wanted Steve out of my house, so I evicted him December of 20. And like Julie said, he's the sacred cow of the ministry. I went against the sacred cow, and therefore, basically, that was the end for me. Fortunately, I was able to move into that place. Otherwise, I wouldn't have had a place to go. Number four, I would like you to admit in writing that I advised you not to go over to Shiloh and video from the street for your prospective customer the day Steve yelled at you. This is very interesting because he's admitting I was at the street. That's what I told him. I said, my prospective tenant needs to do this today because he's making decisions about where to move. I can't wait for Steve to get out. Kent did tell me to wait until Steve was out, but I had no idea Steve was even leaving. He kept threatening that he was never going to leave and he was going to take me to court and it was illegal to evict him because of COVID, blah, blah, blah. By the way, it's only illegal to evict them because of COVID if COVID has influenced their paycheck. If they're still getting their paycheck, COVID has nothing to do with an eviction, at least at that time. So if you'll listen to Kent's lie about the morning wood, he says that I woke him up. If I'm in the street and the house is 200 yards away from the street, how, how does that wake him up? Fact of the matter is he had a U-Haul in the driveway. He was in the process of moving out and stealing my washer and dryer and probably was real angry that I was there with a video camera. I had no idea that he was doing that. I was just showing the prospective tenant I have a letter from that person that verifies this information. So Steve comes out to the road yelling and screaming at me. And when I said, Steve, I am not videoing you. I'm showing the house to a prospective tenant, which by the way, a landlord has the right to do. He went back in the house and came out 30 seconds later with his right hand on his right pocket. I knew it was a gun. I know Steve, I've seen this before. I have on my channel four other people that have seen Steve with guns, including a videotape from Steve's own security camera showing his right hand on his right pocket with Bagel the dog right before Bagel got shot. The man is a thug. Kent is defending a thug and absolutely persecuting his innocent wife. He doesn't want innocent wives who tell the truth. He wants dumb wives who tell, who do exactly what he says and who say exactly what he tells them to say, who have a lobotomy, who will do and say anything just to keep their marriage. I will do and say anything just to keep the truth because I serve God. I don't serve a man. I loved my husband. I wanted to be there for my husband. I tried to do the submission, but just like in the military, you submit to your commander, but you have the right of conscientious objection. Kent is a tyrant a dictator who wishes to take that away from me. I will not lie under the guise of submission. Kent Hoven would not budge on that matter. He required absolute submission over truth. He knows Steve threatened me with a gun. He's lying to protect his reputation because that's how they get their money. 
by Kent's reputation. Yeah, there's a video if you want to see more on that. Here is my playlist, Kent Hovind exposed by his, quote, morning wood, end quote, lie and perversion. There's three videos in that playlist. You'll see the bottom one with Matt Powell. Matt Powell sat right next to Kent Hovind as he described the morning wood. Shame on you, Matt Powell. Shame on you. Like, I don't know the difference between a gun and morning wood. I'm 60 years old. I know the difference. Number five, I would like you to admit in writing that you did not see Steve with a gun and send him a sincere apology for your part in evicting him and falsely accusing him. Number six, I would like you to admit in writing that you donated plants and the greenhouse to the ministry and that you left, and I put Debbie in charge of plants. He put Debbie in charge of my greenhouse and my thousands of dollars of plants before I left. She traipsed into my greenhouse with all her potted plants from Texas and placed them on top of my plants, killing the plants I had in that greenhouse. I went in and placed them on the floor. Didn't hurt her plants, just saved my plants. The next day, I go in and they're back on top of my babies. I went to Kent. He said, she's in charge. She can do whatever she wants to your greenhouse. And yet Kent says he wasn't trying to drive me away and he was a good husband. That is disrespect to the nth degree and intentional trying to drive me out. I put Debbie in charge of plants and that you should have asked her permission before you did anything with the plants on DAL property. Can you just smell the appreciation for the thousands of dollars I put into that landscape? Number seven, I would like you to send her a sincere apology for reacting to her in a less than respectful manner. I don't think I reacted to her at all. I never even spoke to the woman. I went directly to Kent. I don't know what he's talking about. Number eight, I would like you to admit in writing that you have no evidence that Steve broke the window at Shiloh. That's utter baloney. Okay, Steve gave me notice that he had vacated at around five o'clock, six o'clock in the afternoon. This is in the video Thug Life. Here's the playlist containing Thug Life. The playlist is called Kent Hovind's Crimes Against Cindy and Kent Hovind's Pattern of Slandering. So at the top, you'll see Thug Life. Kent Hovind allows Steve to damage Cindy's rental property. Abuse by Kent Hovind's men. That's a very long documentary. It shows texts, recordings, video, all my proof. The second video is the guilty verdict. The judge rules in favor of Cindy Lincoln against Hovind Associate, who vandalized her home. I think it's in Thug Life where it actually shows the audio recording where Kent and Steve are conspiring about the vandalism to my home. So this guilty verdict against Steve Lynn is a reflection on Kent Hovind as well. Kent Hovind knew about it, and at the very least, he allowed it. He didn't chastise Steve in any way. He promoted him to the board the very next day. Again, part of the intentional driving Cindy away. Cindy's the whistleblower. Get rid of her. Now, in that, Kent Hovind lying about Steve Lynn threatening Cindy and others with a gun, there are like four or five of us who had incidents with Steve and his gun. Under that is the famous Brady Byram sickening eight-page letter where Kent Hovind again uses Brady Byram to abuse his wife. Here's the body slam audio I put together in, that shows the evidences that created the guilty verdict, the panty incident. 
Kent is now lying about this as well, and this shows proof that he intentionally put women's underwear in our master bathroom on Christmas Eve before Matt Powell was to show up on Christmas Day in order to get me to blow my fuse in front of all the Christmas guests so he could do what he's doing now and say, look, see, my wife is crazy. No, most women would be upset if they found women's underwear in their husband's bathroom, in their marriage bathroom. And at that point, I already knew of his intentional provocation tactics and so I was able to hold my cool. So there's time-stamped photographs as all my videos. I'm trying my best to show my proof because Kent Hoven is a liar to his very core. And it looks like his new wife is perfectly willing to do the same. And I want people who actually want to know the truth to be able to see the evidence uh, there's Alexander Alfano in that video entitled Kent Hovind Exposed by Cindy Lincoln, a meeting that Kent had with Alexander Alfano that was recorded. Here's Kent and Brady, and again, you'll see the Wonder Films watermark that indicates it's one of Steve Boland's videos. So when Steve Boland says, oh, I didn't find anything incriminating about you, Pastor Hovind. It's a lie. Okay, here's two of them right here with the Wonder Films watermark. Those are Steve Boland's incriminating evidence that he did find about Kent Hovind. Kent saying, Cindy won't need her money if she's dead. And then under that, you haven't missed a payment and you won't. I have several text messages that are saying, my word is good. You don't need a contract. Uh-huh. There's Mark Stoney's video showing the guilty verdict on Kent Hovind's domestic assault. This guy, surviving narcissism, his name is Dr. Les Carter. He was my lifeline while I was still living in that situation, in the spare room, crying all the time. This is what trauma bonding with a narcissist does to a decent person. Mark Stoney also did a video on reactive abuse. It's where the person that is being gaslit finally snaps finally reacts. It's like you can have a really gentle dog, but if you put that gentle dog in a corner and start kicking him, that gentle dog will eventually try to bite you. And that's what Kent Hoven did to me. I am a gentle, loving, generous person who came there to serve God. And I wanted to give myself in service to a man who I thought was promoting the gospel in a very devoted way. And Kent Hovind kept kicking me and kicking me and kicking me and kicking me and kicking me. And because I believe in a marriage vow, I didn't leave. I kept taking it. And now in retrospect, I wonder... And in fact, I believe it was Mark Stoney, maybe it was Jeff, said to me, we didn't understand why you were still there. Trauma bonding is a lot like Stockholm Syndrome. It's where they'll be mean and then they'll be nice. And then they'll be mean and then they'll be nice. You keep waiting for the nice to come back. You keep shaking your head going, no, that mean stuff couldn't have happened because a nice person wouldn't do that. That's gaslighting where they're trying to drive you crazy. Here is another submission and abuse teaching. 
what the Bible really teaches about abuse and submission. Look at that beautiful thumbnail. Perpetuating abuse in the name of submission. I believe that's just a recording of Mike Winger's teaching on that. He does a thorough expose of the scriptural teaching on submission and abuse. Here's another property that Kent Hovind's thugs destroyed. Here is Jonathan Reif refuting the bipolar lie. Wow, it looks like I have a whole playlist just on the volunteers that expose Kent's lying about me being bipolar long term. Volunteers that were there for over a year. Looks like there's 12 of them. Kent Hovind exposed by numerous former workers, all with the same experiences. 70 interviews, wow. For those who want to know the truth, there are lots of witnesses and lots of evidence. When Julie and I say something radical, like Kent is lying through his teeth, when he's supposedly this well-known evangelist with videotapes that sell millions of copies, that's a radical thing to say. But Julie worked there for three years. And when she quit, I was still there. And she was still my friend and still following all this crap that was happening. So just like me, she's got five years observing Kent Hovind's criminal behavior. Thug life. It's four hours. I'm sorry. I was depressed. I'm talking slow in that video. And there was a ton of evidence. So I presented all the videos, the texts. So you'll see the text with the time stamp on it, giving the time that Steve vacated. And I was there within two or three hours. And when I got there, there was no evidence that anybody else had been in there, just Steve. And the window was broken and I have it on video. Yeah, that's evidence that Steve broke the window. Number nine, I would like you to admit in writing that you will drop all complaints about Steve, Ernie, Debbie, and admit that I, as founder and director of the ministry, have the right to hire and fire whoever I want to for various positions, and that you will, from now on, offer your suggestions about staff, but once I make a decision, I have no right to complain about Steve and Ernie and Debbie abusing me, that he gets to hire whoever he wants to. Yeah, he does. He has the right to abuse me. He has the right to let Steve, Ernie, and Debbie abuse me. He has the right to lie to them so that they will think that I'm worthy of the abuse. Steve's Kent's right-hand man, and he can call me a Jezebel, no problem, and a snake, and a fucking bitch. And Ernie, as... Kent's other right-hand man, financier, president of the board, has the right to call me a bipolar idiot, a spoiled brat, all in writing, all in writing. Next text, number nine, that you will accept and support my decision. Yes, sir. Remember Joe Hovind on tape talking to Kent in jail? She says, yes, sir. I used to say yes, sir, to my husband all the time. But I don't say yes, sir, that you're going to allow Steve to call me names, Ernie to call me names, Brady to call me names. What's wrong with you? Why would you even want your wife to do that? That is not submission. That is Kent being the spoiled brat needing to get his way. And you will not sow discord among brethren over my decisions about staff and ministry. So I'm not allowed to tell anybody else, any other brothers or staff members, about Kent's abuse, about the name calling, about not paying rent. I'm supposed to act like everything's great. Number 10, I want you to admit in writing that there was never a complete agreement about what items you donated to the ministry and what items you felt were investing, hoping for a return. Again, utter stupidity. We had a contract. Everything after the contract was in fulfillment thereof. 
Kent and Ernie signed a contract for 20 years of payments in respect of that. Number 11, on the same topic, I want you to admit in writing that I have repaid you $50,000 toward this supposed debt. That's another lie. He bought the motorhome from me. So when you buy somebody's motorhome, does that mean that was a $10,000 payment towards the debt? Do you see how sneaky this guy is? And do you know what he said to me? He said, well, it was still in CSE name. Ernie never transferred the title when I bought it. So it was still in CSE name. That's why Kent is saying that that went towards the debt. He is a liar and a con artist beyond what I have ever, ever seen in my life. It's disgraceful. He's got no conscience whatsoever. Neither does Steve nor Ernie. Number 12, I want you to admit in writing that if indeed we remarry, you will change your name on all needed documents to be Cindy Lee Lincoln. I think this is a typo here. I think he meant that to be Cindy Hovind because I never changed my name to Cindy Hovind and that is what he was using against me to say that I wasn't a submissive wife. I didn't give him all my assets. I didn't take his name. And at the time, Kent, Ernie, Bill Sardi, and myself all agreed that that was a wise thing to do. Again, bait and switch is what con artists do. 13. I want you to agree that you and I will meet with Alexander when he comes up for boot camp and discuss whether you should be allowed to retain rental properties and investments separate from your husband and that we will both agree in advance that his decision will be final and we will follow it. Once his decision is made, neither of us will complain about it. Do you see the subtlety here? Basically, and I have two other where he overtly says, I have to give him all my assets, that I am just a woman and that I'm not allowed to have property. I'm not allowed to have my own income source. I have to be dependent on my husband. That makes you more submissive, right? If you don't have any money of your, of your own, you have to do what he says or you're homeless. That's the way Kent wants it. Again, that's the polar opposite, a bait and switch from our prenuptial agreement. We had a prenuptial agreement. It was verbal. It involved Ernie, who will lie about it now, Bill Sardi, and everybody else on campus knew. We had agreed that I would maintain control and freedom with my own inheritance. Who in the heck does he think he is to say that I don't have a right to have my own property? That is not biblical. That is twisting the scriptures to, for your own selfishness need for power and control on greed vow of poverty my rear end kent is the greediest son i've ever met he's willing to put money over his wife again total bait and switch when we got married it was all sure honey you can have freedom over your own money we had a very gracious and loving relationship until the drug bust with steve and that's when he started this whole submission whip on my back. He preferred to cover Steve and his drugs. And later on, Mark and I, when we both left in January of 21, and Mark was determined to find out about Zaire, we started finding there was more to that cover-up than just Steve and his drugs. Steve was stealing from the ministry, Ernie's skimming off the top, and there's pedophiles involved. Yes, Kent had to get rid of me. Number 14, I want you to agree in writing that if we remarry and you return to work in the ministry, that your pay will be $1,300 per month. I refused to take a paycheck. The whole five years, I worked for free. Uh, No, the $1,300 a month is the contract that you signed for 20 years because I gave so much money. And here's further insult, minus $50 for each day that you are not a submissive wife and sleep in the other room. 
When I get called a Jezebel and Kent doesn't protect me, when Steve threatens me with a gun and trashes my property and Kent won't even come to the property and look to see if I'm telling the truth or not, he won't even come view the damages. It's called culpable deniability for sleazeballs like Kent. Yeah, I don't want to sleep with him. He's abusing me. So he's going to charge me for that. I'll be home Sunday night and will serve the official annulment document Monday. Then, if you clearly understand what I want in a relationship, I will offer to take you on a date. Joshua 24. Of course, we have to throw those scriptures in there to twist them using God's name in vain.